All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. I'm Raf Giallo alongside Anthony Pine of RT Sport Online. We're also joined by former Ireland striker David Connolly. Quite a lot to talk about the boys in green kicking off their Nations League campaign on Saturday against Armenia. The under-21s are also facing a triple header that could decide whether they get to the European Championships. There's a Champions League final to reflect on, and also we'll be chatting League of Ireland later on when David Snade will be joining us. But um, first off, I suppose, Anthony, the squad was named uh, last week, uh, Stephen Kenny's squad, and uh, not too many surprises, obviously a few injuries uh, in and around Matt Doherty and Adam Ida, Andrew Amabamadele, but we knew in those cases that they would not be available for this window. But in a way, while transitions never end, I get the feeling that now, in terms of at least narratives around the Ireland squad, we're straight into results business. Yeah, we are because it's there's four games in 14 days, and as Stephen Kenny has said from a long way out that he he wants to win this Nations League group. That it's important, like there's tangible rewards for winning it in terms of promotion to League A and getting to play the top tier nations, and then ramifications with the uh, qualification ca- campaign as well. Um, and yeah, it's going to be really interesting win though, Raf. I mean, the big news from the squad announcement was Michael Abafemi is back in the panel. I haven't been out. I, th- I think it's a couple of years since Michael Oba Femi actually. He's only got one cap to his name. Um, and there was a couple of interesting additions as well. I think CJ Hamilton is, is quite an in- interesting addition um, because it's an indication of he's the type of player that is benefiting from the fact that Kenny has such a, a clear blueprint and idea of how he wants the team to play now. There's a system. There's a very clear system. And Hamilton is a guy that potentially can thrive in that system or do at least do well in that system. Ogbeni is a good example of someone who came in and was used in a very particular way. So when you have a clear identity and an idea of how you want to play, you can start to target players to slot into st- certain areas and certain positions. So um, I haven't seen CJ Hamilton, to be honest with you. What, what we hear, uh, David said actually has a really good piece on him from a couple of months ago on the 42, a good profile of him. So we know he's extremely quick. He's, he's versatile. He can play along anywhere across the front three. Um, and when you see the impact that Ogbeni had when he first came into the squad, he'd be hoping that maybe something not, not quite as impactful, but similar, you know, even off the bench, because he's, he's such pace and Stephen Kenny expects these games to be quite open against Scotland, Ukraine and even Armenia. He doesn't expect any of those teams to sit back, he expects them all to try and come and play. So that might leave uh, gaps and areas where Hamilton with his pace could could exploit. So it's an interesting win, though. It would be interesting to see if uh, Obafeni gets his shot. He's done really well at Swansea in the last few months where they, uh, the manager there, Martin, Russell Martin, started to play him through the middle and that coincided with a real upturn in his form. So it'll be interesting to see if, if Stephen Kenny starts, gives him a chance through the middle, particularly with Ida missing. He might, he might get an opportunity to play there. Um, and this is a chance now. This is a real chance to build. Like there's Momentum has been building for the last year, but this can really accelerate positive momentum for Kenny if he can you know come out with this block of games with uh, let's say unbeaten uh, yeah, 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 yeah. three wins and a draw or something you know that 10 points out of that block really leaves you in good shape so yeah it's uh, it's going to be uh, exciting window and uh, plenty of football to look forward to yeah, and the block starts with Armenia this Saturday, as I said, and it is live on RT2 and the RT player coverage starts at one o'clock and kick off at two. And then on Wednesday of next week on the 8th, it's Ukraine at home and then Scotland at home three days later on Saturday. And then we're playing Ukraine and Poland on Tuesday, 14th of June, and that's the end of the window. So, David, um, as Anthony outlined there, you know, there's there's the opportunity for positive momentum, but given that I guess Armenia are going to be viewed as the weakest team in this Nations League group. There is a lot of pressure riding on this game on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, and um, I, I think certainly Armenia first, I think, helps us. You know, um, I know they had a man sent off against, against Norway, but but nonetheless, you know, they were smashed in their last game by nine. And, you know, Stephen's talked, talked this up a lot. You know, he wants a good positive start. I, I agree with, with a lot of uh, what Anthony's saying. The only thing I'd say is is uh, that centre forward position I think is one that that I know Callum's done really well f- for us, but he hasn't played at all for West Brom, and when he has, he's been off the bench. And his last start was was way back in April for his club. Um, I'm not too sure that's going to change next season. 
Um, so for me, Michael Oberfemi, I would love to see him play down through the middle. You know, <clears throat> ironically, I don't know why Southampton sold him because there was a little window for him there, I think, if they'd have kept with him. And I know people might say about his attitude or, or this or that, and Stevens tried to downplay that. And I think that's right because you've got to manage all sorts of different characters. I think he's got something that maybe a lot of the other centre forwards don't have. I think he's got a nice mix of everything. And I think you can find spaces for players, you know, who've got that bit of belief, right? He believes in himself and he might have a point to prove with dropping down to Swansea, you know, playing under a, a manager who plays a similar way. I mean, they play quite similar, you know, to try and dominate the ball, back three, et cetera. Um, and, and Callum's done great. But uh, I just wonder, there's a few players who, who, who might be playing next season, you know, that I think Steven will be forced to play. And, and I, think, I think Michael's one, and I think Travers might be another one. You know, at the top, at both ends of the pitch, I think things might change. If Michael keeps going, if Travers is playing in the Premier League, at both ends of the pitch, I think, I think Stephen might be forced to sort of have a rethink because you, you can't keep playing Callum if he's not starting games. It's so difficult, I, I think. Yeah, on the goalkeeper situation, actually, on Travers, um, as you said, um, his form will might actually force Kenny's hand in the long term. Do you think this window, though, it's uh, like it's very unlikely given Bazunu has had the shirt, Kelleher's yeah. been Kelleher's been in possession for the March games, but uh, generally I would imagine, as we talked about the idea of transition, that Kenny probably won't make that change in June. No, no he probably won't. I, I think that's fair enough. And look, Gavin's had a great season, so so is Cuevan, but 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 nonetheless, I think he will also be thinking in his mind. Uh, you know, in because he likes to plan ahead, right? He likes to have targets. He set this himself. He always has targets. So if he, if he has targets, his targets will be thinking longer term as well. So, um, you know, look, there's a lot of players who've had good ends to the season. You know, Troy had a good end to the season, didn't he? MK Dons didn't work out, but at least he was scoring and playing well. Um, you know, Gavin was player of the year for Pompey. I know they love him down there. I've been down at Portsmouth a lot. They, they think he's done brilliantly and he is a top keeper. You know, it, he just needs to make sure he's uh, he's competing, I think, high top end of the, of the championship or even Premier League somewhere, you know? Yeah. Now, we, we'll, we'll touch more on Ireland and different facets of the, the squad from the forward line and the amount of pace in it and then also the structure of the defence because obviously Matt Doherty's injury will change things. But um, you mentioned Armenia there, uh, David, a little bit earlier on in terms of their weaknesses. So yesterday I was speaking to Robert Gasparian, who is a sports journalist and commentator from Armenia who works for Satanta Sports Eurasia and um, how he sets out what Arme what's going on in Armenia at the moment. It's not particularly good, which probably adds pressure for Ireland. So let's listen to a clip where he discusses Joaquin Kaparos, the manager, what he's changed for Armenia and uh, just the players we have to look out for. The main thing that Kaparos changed in the Armenian national team is that the Armenian national team start keeping the ball. Uh, like, uh, it's the main thing that Kaparos made. Uh, like, Armenian national team uh, during uh, that uh, uh, Nations, League, uh, Nations League campaign uh, was uh, having a, a good ball control. It is the, the main thing. Uh, you know, uh, it's strange, but we have a really good player in Armenian national team named Sarkis Adamian that he, he plays in Brugge in Belgium. He's playing really well in his club. But every time, like Aparos uh, says, and even Miki says in private uh, conversations with me, like something strange in the neighborhood, like it was in, in the, the, the uh, song in Ghostbusters. Uh, like uh, something strange uh, with uh, Adamian. He's wearing a national team jersey and he's becoming like ghosts. He's becoming like a smoke from Mortal Kombat. He's disappearing from the, from the, from the field. He's a really good striker. But in national team, he doesn't show all, all, uh, all the things he got. Uh, another good player that can uh, change uh, the game it is uh, Eduard Spertian. Eduard Spertian is the second uh, central midfielder in the field uh, who is playing in the, in the center with defensive midfielder. He, he will have a key role in uh, midfield area. He can uh, take the ball and uh, enter to the almost... Uh, the, the final part, the final third of the field, Eduard Spertian, he, will, he would wear number eight. Uh, also, uh, like uh, we have uh, Tigran Barsegian who had amazing left foot, but he only left foot he, he has 
nothing else. Uh, I don't think so that uh, the, uh, the national team players uh, of today uh, are uh, strong enough to make a concurrence against uh, uh, Ireland national team. All right, so that is Robert Gasparian of Satanta Sports Eurasia. So you can watch that full chat. It's on the RT Sport YouTube channel. It's also on RT, uh, rt.ie slash sport and also on all our podcast channels. So he goes in depth. They have a lot of problems. Henrik Mkhitaryan, their greatest ever player, has retired from international football. He announced it in March, and it's actually caused a bit of a divide, not quite to Saipan levels. But um, anyway, in Armenia, it, it came as a bit of a surprise to me because he's clearly the greatest player they've ever produced. And also, as uh, Robert Gasparian has discussed there, you know, the... The, there isn't the talent in the squad is quite limited. I hope the the player that only has a left foot and nothing else going for him is also starting <laughs> for them. That would be uh, that would be good from from our point of view. But in general, they're coming in in terrible form. One win in eleven games, and last game they got absolutely annihilated by Norway nine nil, albeit in a friendly. But um, in terms of what Ireland then um, have on our front, as you've, men- as you've, as you've mentioned, uh, David, there is a lot of pace with Abba Femi, CJ Hamilton, some of the options there. It seems to be something, and we saw it, I think, against Azerbaijan um, last year. It's a facet of the game that Kenny really wants to build on, on the counter. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think you mentioned the form that they're in, but, you know, um, they did win their last game at home. So, um, however, I, I think you, you go back to the North Macedonia game, they were put five past them. I think, as I said, out of all the games coming up, I think, I think, it, I think it might help us that we're playing Armenia first. And, and if we take any other sort of form, and judging by the mood in the camp, you know, Stephen was saying the lads are in great form, you know, everyone can't wait to meet up. I was looking at some videos on Twitter, you know, uh, the lads training and, and the atmosphere that's around the place. Um, you know, and for some of those players that haven't been playing, you know, they know they can go there, as you mentioned. I don't think it count against them necessarily in terms of maybe Callum not playing or, or whatever. Um I think they'll be able to really attack this game away from home uh, as the home team Armenia, you know, will have to try and make some of the running. And as you say, that should leave a, a lot of space down the outsides. And I think Stephen is very keen to get pace in the team. And he does have that now. You know, I mean, I've seen CJ Hamilton for a number of years because he's, you know, he was in the lower leagues at Mansfield and um, he was a player that was often on the radar of other teams potentially. Could he make that step up? Um and I think it's, you know, it's a shrewd sort of move bringing him in. You know, I think he's another player that adds to having that little bit of pace out wide, which is what they've got now, you know. Yeah, which uh, I think also it's worth bringing Festi Ebosele into the conversation yeah. here because he also has pace. He's a bit raw, but he's had a good season with Derby County. He's going well, off. The, the, the worst thing, though, for him now is if yeah. he goes to Udinese, right? And, and I've had this before talking about it because, you know, Udinese and Watford, I, I think he'll be at Watford pretty soon, you know. So those two, I mean, you know, there's death taxes and players move between Udinese and Watford. Now, firstly, whether it's the right move, I made a similar move age of, you know, I should have been maybe football somewhere, uh, you know, more regularly. It works out for him. Yeah, we've seen Josh Cullen go, go abroad and, and, it, and it work out great. So it can go both ways. Yeah, but as you said, probably the likelihood is he'll be uh, he'll be a Watford player in a, Watford, in a relatively yeah, short space yeah. of time, given the relationship between uh, both of those clubs. Um, Anthony, I know you've said it a few times um, on this podcast, but that Ireland have developed into this sort of system team. Uh, the and it does switch between. Obviously, it's always a back three, but it either is going to be three players up front or it's going to be a two. And sometimes we look better with more um, more kind of uh, more bodies in midfield. Yeah, well, it was interesting when Stephen Kenny, when the, when the squad dropped, Evaseli was listed as a forward. He was listed among the forwards. So uh, Kenny was was asked about that and he sees Bestie as uh, a right winger more so than, you know, a, a wing back or a functional right back, uh, which is sort of an indication again of like bringing players in with specific roles in mind for them. 
And there has been little tweaks in Kenny's run. He hasn't played the same way throughout. He's changed. You know, he's changed things. And he, I think he had to change because some things weren't working. But he, he's, he's sort of settled now on a way of playing and a style and a system. And as I said, I, I think that is um, really influencing the type of players who are getting called into the squad, which is, is a good thing. You know, you can imagine the, the consistency of the way you're training and players starting to understand exactly what's um, expected of them going out to play games. I mean, I don't know, we might touch on Nottingham Forest later on, but, you know, their promotion to the Premier League, uh, when Steve Cooper came in and took them over, the players were sort of talking about that. You know, they were bottom of the league uh, when he took, I think he came in last September uh, after Chris Hewton, wasn't it? So um, he came in with a very defined, clear way and idea of playing and entrusted the players. There were some players that were on the periphery that weren't getting a look in and, and he, he gave them a chance and he improved them. And I think it's similar with Ireland. Now, listen, there's still, this, this is a defining period for Stephen Kenny. Like he has turned things around after a really poor start in terms of results. And there were some bad days, you know, we know that. Um, but this is a chance now to really hammer home the sense that things are moving in the right direction and that this, you know, enhance the confidence further in the way that he's approaching games and, and the, the, the style and the system that he has in mind. Um, because at the minute right now, it's a fragile thing. You know, momentum is a fragile thing and confidence is a fragile thing. But at the moment, it does seem like everybody's absolutely buying into this and believing in it and starting to see tangible rewards in it. But as we touched on earlier, now you've got four, a four-game block that can go either way. If you come out the other side of this block in good shape, you know, again, it just it just breeds confidence within everyone, including themselves, including Stephen Kenny himself, that, yep, yeah, I am on the right path here. Um Obviously, if you have a couple of bad results and, you know, you drop points at Armenia and you're beaten by Ukraine, it can go the other way. But I, I do feel like I, I would fancy Ireland to have a good period here because, as I said, there is a consistency. There is a plan. There's players now being coming in. There's no, there, there's a lot less square pegs and round holes isn't it? with Ireland now. It's, you kind of feel like everybody has been given specific uh, roles and uh, jobs within the side. Um. And, uh, yeah, within that, as I said, the likes of Hamilton, Ebisades, you know, these guys are going to get their chance. Alba Femi through the middle, as David touched on, they're, they're going to get their shot over this window. So, um, as I said, like, we'll know a lot more about Ireland the next, uh, at the other end of this block. But uh, it's, a, it's a real chance for this team, players within it and the manager, to build further on the good momentum that they've, uh, that they've built over the last year. Yeah, and I think David Snade has joined us now as well. So, David, how are you? How's it going? Sorry, I'm late. Oh no, you're arri- 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 arriving late into the box. <laughs> At the top, I was uh, I was going to I was going to ask you, would you prefer being David, Dave, or something different? Because we've two Davids on today, and I believe in democracy. So, um, <laughs> with with the imperfect nature of democracy, David Connolly gets to choose uh, which way uh, how he wants to be referred, and then you just have to kind of put up with whatever uh, the the uh, the detritus yeah. that's left after. I know. Listen, I'll, I'll, I'll bow to um, David's seniority. I've, I've been, to be honest, I've been known as Snyder since I was, I was six. So. I don't really, I don't really want. I don't, we don't know each other that well, so I'm going to struggle, <laughs> no, I'm gonna struggle <laughs> throwing out Snader there. But um, oh. anyway, um, I, Anthony Pine was uh, was um, mentioned uh, that you'd written a, a really good piece about CJ Hamilton a couple of months ago for the 42. Oh, yeah. So just in terms of his profile as a player, obviously he's somebody who spent his childhood in Waterford and obviously he's playing for Black for Blackpool. But uh, in terms of his profile, both on and off the pitch, what's he like? He's a player. I think one of the reasons maybe why the, the, the Ireland setup seems to have been happy to bring him in. He's a fellow who kind of takes on information fairly quickly, doesn't need to be told stuff more than once, and it's quite switched on. Very aggressive in how he presses from the front, but also has a has a goal in him and is very positive in his pace. Obviously, can be light and quick. Um, I yeah, that's that piece they did with the forty two. Spoke to Graham Coughlin, who would have been his manager. Uh, obviously, Graham Coughlin obviously from Dublin would have been his manager at Mansfield when he was in League Two. And he was just just struck him as a player who could rise through levels given given the opportunity, and he seems to have taken that on really. Um, and from an early, from an early point, they made it clear that he wanted to play for Ireland. Um, but obviously at that point, wasn't really in a position where he could be knocking doors down, even though it was put out by people, obviously by Graham Coughlin and other people at Blackpool that he did qualify. Um, but yeah, you know, it just strikes as a, as as a fellow who can is direct and has that sharp sharpness and pace, but 
more so it's just switched on to different demands that would be required. And one of the things Graham had mentioned as well was just, again, I'm, I don't properly understand the, the coaching detail of it, but the trigger points of when the press and when to kind of how to almost kind of move defenders around. I don't know, David would be better at maybe having that understanding and, and from a from a proper football understanding point of view. But um he just seems like a fellow who's just very switched on to different demands and stuff that's asked of him, which when you're going into an international setup will be key, considering even though this is a, this might feel like a bit more of a club void because of the four games in a in a short space of time. But when you need to be taking on information quickly and have that kind of football intelligence to be able to do it, I think that's probably where CJ Hamilton kind of scores high in as well. Yeah, and I suppose it goes back to what Anthony's been saying about the sort of system feel to the way Stephen Kenny has run the squad since he's since he's come in. But um, someone who's actually on the outside of it now, Aaron Connolly, David um, Connolly this time, um, he's... <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, no, no relation, Aaron Connolly. But in in regards to um, obviously he's he's had he's had his injury struggles, but obviously his loan at Middlesbrough didn't go quite as well as he wanted. I know Stephen Kenny um referenced that very recently that you know you don't judge a player on the first loan, but you when you look at the progress that some of the other players that have um have made their way into the Ireland squad and developed since then, what what do you feel about Aaron Connolly's situation, David? Yeah, I think I think um, if if we touch on his manager at Middlesbrough, you know, <clears throat> I think he was going to a manager in Chris Wilder who's very demanding, but Chris would always always want four strikers, and I think Aaron would have known he was going to get opportunities, but it was up to him to take them. Now I've been at the Amex, I've sat behind Aaron when he's been sat on that bench, <clears throat> and let me tell you, he doesn't seem the most enthusiastic to go and get warmed up. <clears throat> to come on, you know, and I and I've looked at him closely, and and when he hasn't been playing, I, I I just wonder what he's like, you know. He wasn't happy. He wasn't playing at Brighton. He's gone to Middlesbrough. <clears throat> he wasn't playing. He wasn't starting. You know, he's not happy. I, I think Graham Potter, whether he's trying to ease him out because that's Graham's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's Graham's style. But Graham, obviously, is a top, top manager. Brighton finished highest ever. You know, CJ Hamilton's playing under Neil Critchley, a terrific manager as well. You know, some of the Irish lads have got some really good managers. It concerned me that maybe Graham doesn't seem to have a space for him when they're not blessed with goal-scoring centre-forwards, you know. And <clears throat> don't get me wrong, I've, I've been, you know, at Sunderland where we've had a lot of talent. I mean, Jordan Henderson was in the youth team when I was at Sunderland. And players like that, Martin Wagon, on their first loan, homesick, couldn't wait to get back. But, I mean, this is a road that's so well-travelled for Irish players. I mm. mean, for him to go up to Middlesbrough was <clears throat> coming over from Ireland from a young age. I mean, I don't think that's any real excuse, like, about a first loan. I, 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 just, I just think he's... I, I think he's got a bit of work to do, you know, and, and certainly the way Troy's attacked MK Dons, playing out position, playing wherever the manager wants... You know, I have a bit of worries about Aaron in terms of where he goes from here because I think Chris is a very... I know Chris Wilder a little bit. I know people that worked under him. I know his staff. <clears throat> a lot of people have so many good things to say about him. Mm. I think it would have given Aaron a lot of opportunities to impress him in training with his behaviours, etc. But he also doesn't suffer falls at all. So it'd be worrying me that he didn't have the impact that he wanted. So, from Aaron Connolly's perspective, just as, as you say that, like, what should he be like? What should happen next? I mean, what's the spark to kind of get him going? Well, it's, where would he? Where would he go? Where's his next loan going to be? Yeah, That's the, it? it's a good, and it's a good point. Like, even like I was out at the Ireland Under Twenty Ones press yesterday, and um, Connor Coventry was making this point. He had a very bad experience on loan with Peterborough at the lower end of the Championship last season where he just, he kind of played a few games, got bombed out with the team, then was on the bench. They were struggling. It wasn't a great environment for him to be in. Then he had the opportunity to go to MK, who are MK Dons, who are fighting at the top end of League One. And like what Dave, David said there about um, Troy Parrott, he kind of just took that chance and said, right, it doesn't matter if I'm going to League One, from going from a Premier League club to the Championship to, to League One. He went into an environment where he felt, you know what, I can go and play. And he, he took that opportunity. And like, 
sometimes sometimes you just need to actually just take you need to sometimes you just need to grow up cop on a little bit and take the opportunity and realize that yeah you done well in the Premier League environment you had a great start but it's like what Neil Warnock said about the lad it was a Jed Spence you can either go to Premier League or non-league like football like you, you do have to strike while the iron is hot and make the most of when you're looked upon as a as a talent who has a bright future by doing the right stuff around the place and I know in, in Aaron Connolly's point his attitude and his application has been something that has been questioned and he's been given those opportunities I, I, I did a piece um, actually spoke to Chris Wilder for it about about uh, Enda Stevens again Enda Stevens had a, a brutal long sp- period under uh, Chris Wilder I think it was at Northampton I wasn't pretty certain he was the manager at Northampton at the time when um, Enda was at Aston Villa but Enda switched on and copped on after that. He realised he wasn't doing enough to what he needed to be as a professional. Chris Wilder had actually given him that kick up the arse that was that was needed. And I know what Aaron Connolly, to give him his due a little bit, I think he's not properly been able to train as well. He's been getting injections just to get through weeks and to be available for games. So there is that element of things as well where like, I just don't think his body is even right at the moment as well. So it's it's a big, it's a big moment from just this summer in terms of what where he goes and then the start of next season because you can be for, you can be forgotten about very quickly you really can yeah certainly because obviously his star rose very quickly after that Spurs game uh, three years ago and I think there was an expectation he'd push on and he's been overtaken now within the Ireland squad one last point on him uh, David Connolly um <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll, I'll persevere by saying by uh, going with the full names. I would do respect. Okay. I would do respect for both of you. Um, do you think? And you've had the experience of going abroad, um, playing with Feyenoord and Excelsior. Um, but do you? Um, do you think maybe he's a player that might benefit from going further afield, getting away from getting away from the UK and from you know being in the loan cycle and just finding a home somewhere? I'm not sure. I, I think there's enough clubs. Um... Aaron's issue may be that he he feels he's he's ready and he's good enough to to play games in the Premier League, and maybe you know his own manager doesn't think that. So I think he's got to accept that and then go to the and go to the Championship, which is still a very you know a really good level, and find somewhere that is willing. You know, a lot of teams now are playing with two strikers, right? It's not as if Aaron's asked to play up there on his own. Middlesbrough, you know, all season played with two strikers. <laughs> So can he find somewhere if he wants to be in a pair, you know, which I imagine he would do. A lot of teams play with two strikers now. A lot, you know, a lot, a lot of them do. So um, there'll be enough opportunities for him. Um, and even if, if he has to drop lower, has he got an ego that would prevent him doing that? Yeah. You know, when I, when I was at final, I didn't really have an ego. I went on loan to a, a team, the division below. I just wanted to go and play and go and score goals. I didn't have an ego to think, well, I'm not, that's beneath me. Yeah, as you, you said, might have an inner belief. You might yeah. have an inner an inner belief, but but you you, you know you still you, you just need to go and play and and, and uh, finding that that next loan for him is going to be important because a bit you know you could waste six months of the season up to January, which is what he did at Brighton, and then he kind of wasted that before you know it, it's a whole season gone. Yeah. Yeah, and but in terms of obviously he's not there um, for this block of games for Ireland. But yeah. of the strikers and forwards that are there, um, as you said, most a lot of teams play with the two. Sometimes Ireland do, and oftentimes also it's a three. So in terms of if it's a three, uh, David Connolly, um, who do you think Kenny is going to start in Armenia? Oh, uh, that is a. I don't know on the three. I mean, I'd imagine Oberfemi would certainly be one of them. I'd, I'd, I'd imagine it'd be one of them. You know, and then the other two, I'm, I'm not sure. I imagine Callum would, would certainly be, be one. You know, whether he'd be just off, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see Michael as on the last man. I think he's got the pace to do the damage as the last man, and Callum can come and link, um, and then. I don't know, there'd be one more, I think, space, which would be probably up for grabs. Maybe some of the other lads might think. Yeah, Chidozio Bene, more than likely. I think yeah, he's, often, often, he's often taken on that role. And then finally, before we move on to the under-21s, uh, the the defence, uh, Matt Doherty uh, being unavailable and obviously Seamus Coleman now being, you know, uh, well, his role with Ireland is more as sort of the right-sided um, player in the back three. Uh, how do you think uh, Stephen Kenny is going to... Um, restructure the, that that particular position over these four games, uh, David Connolly. Yeah, well, that is. I guess he will 
be thinking about because, as you say, if Seamus, you know, Seamus has, has slotted into that right side centre back role really well, considering his. I mean, there have been once or twice, which I think going down the outside, you might say sometimes I feel that he could be isolated a little bit. One, because of his height on the back post and, and a, a, a few little things like that. But um, whether there's a little move around with, I don't know, Nathan Collins coming in. I, I don't know on the three. O'Shea, um, I think Egan's had a good end to the season. But the right-hand side will be something. Ogbené could also obviously play as that right wing back. You know, he's done that a lot for Rotherham as well. Yeah, and uh, the under twenty ones now. There are they've as well as Ireland having uh, the Ireland senior team having a block of four games, three matches uh, for Jim Crawford's team. So Bosnia on the third of June in Tala, and then there is Montenegro three days later before a trip to Italy eight days later. Um, game taking place in Ascoli, and with the European Championship qualification on the line. Things are finally poised, David Snade. I mean, I was up, uh, I was up at Abbottstown a few weeks ago to chat to Jim Crawford, and there's sort of a you get a kind of quiet confidence off him, and you know he's he often go, he's, he also goes into detail about the amount of detail that they have gone into, even taking in the block of games this time last year, where um, they knew they had a triple header coming up this year, and they've they almost kind of reflected that with the games they chose last time. Yeah, and. Like you say that about going going up the scene, about going up the scene, you do get the sense that there is a real kind of spirit. I know it's something that I've just always talked about our teams. I know that spirit and stuff, but it's been times in the past with the under twenty ones where that maybe hasn't always been the case. Where like that togetherness and the kind of fluidity and how they play and just people understanding their their jobs, it's it does seem to be there now a little bit. That's been rocked. Just don't get me wrong, there's still being sticky patches in this campaign. Obviously losing to. Montenegro away and then obviously losing to Italy which it would not be too unexpected but the way they kind of were able to bounce back as a unit and a group and get those back-to-back wins against Sweden I think just it was something that a few people have spoken about not just even players but that there was a confidence that that could happen because it was a group of players who have that bit of a spirit together that and I know it can be simple actually just do get on and do actually like each other like there's been times where maybe you get a sense with at under 21 level that there could be people, bodies thrown in there possibly don't even really want to be there and that, that if there's a another political almost thing at play in terms of trying to get lads into the in and around the um in and around the camp just to possibly then get them into the senior side or or whatever and it struck me yesterday for speaking to, to Connor Coventry just what how he was talking about like times where yeah he could have maybe not come to certain games no rest of them, but playing for Ireland is his number one like he's gone through a stage now obviously he had a couple and as I mentioned previously a couple of loan spells last year Peter Brown MK Dons and it's already had discussions with David Moyes about what happens next for him at West Ham he wants him to come in and try and do well at the start of pre-season but he kind of knows that he could have to go out on, on that other loan but you, you kind of sense from him he's the one kind of setting the tone a little bit for, for, that, for those around him and really big games you just have to get the six points if they're going to have any chance of getting that playoff really because you would expect Italy to, to still finish top but it would be, be great if it was somehow going into that last game and the, the top spot was set up for grabs but I just think they don't have to concern themselves with even uh, with that it's just making sure you get the win against Bosnia on Friday and then even looking into the Montenegro game because it's just so important because they're on a bit of a not so much a crest of a wave but it feels as if they've got themselves to a point because of all the good work that has been done to, into this part of the campaign to just finish it off and see it through and you kind of have that belief in them as a group of players having that ability but also having just that understanding of the roles that they could go and do it yeah and the positivity you talk about do you feel some of that is also down to the fact that you know, Stephen Kenny is the senior manager. He was previously under 21's boss, and there is a sense of a pathway that is there that maybe, as you kind of outlined there 20 years ago, there wasn't really, you know, the under 21's, to me anyway, when I was growing up, I always kind of felt that it was an afterthought, the way it was even reported on. Yeah, and like, so even yesterday, like, it was put to Conor Coventry. So Conor Coventry is on that he can be, he can become the most capped player at under 20 level for Ireland if he plays the two games this week, he'll overtake Gray and Barnett you get to, on 25 caps. And like ordinarily, you kind of think, well, that might suggest, you know what, that's probably your ceiling then. If you've got that many caps at that level, it means you maybe I might not be quite capable of jumping into the seniors. But those like caps have come over the space of just a three, of three years, not even three years. Do you know what I mean? And he's in a position, he's also in a position where you can see coming down the line a little bit, that there will be a need to have 
more bodies in there. And he's already kind of worked under Stephen Kenny when Stephen Kenny was the 21's manager, so he knows what he's about. And I wouldn't be surprised if if maybe these games hadn't got as much importance on them, if maybe he might have got possibly got a show to be in around the senior, the senior setup. But I think you're right, it's a good point to make in terms of there definitely does seem to be a bit more of not so much feeling for that group. And maybe that could be part of the reason why there does seem to be a bit more of an enthusiasm around the 21's is because they know it genuinely could be a bit more of a springboard now to get into the senior team if you're delivering within that system that's there. Yeah, so the two games, Bosnia and Montenegro, 3rd and 6th of June, and taking place at Tala Stadium, and the games are going to be on RT. And then the Ireland senior game is this Saturday against Armenia, RT2, the RT player, coverage starting at 1 o'clock and kick off at 2. So plenty of action there to look forward to. But I think we need to talk about the Champions League final, which was also live on RT on Saturday night. And uh, I think, Anthony, the story really, the story is on the pitch, and we'll get to that very, very um very shortly but also there is the other story off the pitch yeah well I mean we were speaking just before we started recording and it kind of overshadowed everything you know because it was so grim um initially UEFA blamed the delay and the late arrival of the fans of Liverpool fans at the stadium and that flashed up on the big screen in the ground uh that was then changed that message to say the delay was down to security reasons uh, the last couple of days, they've doubled down. UEFA and, and the authorities, the French authorities, the French interior minister um, has blamed the chaos on fraud on an industrial scale. So in other words, thousands of fake tickets. Uh, the French sports minister explicitly blamed Liverpool fans uh, for turning up without by the tickets. But, I mean, there's there's so much evidence wrapped that this is this was an organisational disaster. And, and this is on UEFA and the French authorities and the Merseyside police would have had people on the ground in Paris. And, and they said the vast majority of Liverpool fans uh, were exemplary. That's the word they used uh, and, and showed remarkable patience. There's a, reports from um, impartial journalists on the ground, uh, from players themselves who would have had family and friends trying to get in. And they were all saying the same things. This was an absolute disaster in terms of the organisation, for, for an event of this scale to be so poorly planned, so poorly thought out. I mean, even, even the idea, if if it was down to the fact that there were so many fans who had fake tickets, I mean, the people who had fake tickets are victims. You know, they would have paid a lot of money for tickets that turned out to be fake. You know, they, they should be treated as such as well, rather than uh, sort of charlatans or trying to chance their arm. Like, that, that, that would not really be the case. You can imagine, like, you know, it's so sophisticated now that a ticket could look perfectly valid. You turn up having paid five hundred pounds or, or a grand or whatever it was, and, and they're told it's turned away. There's also uh, anecdotal evidence of people having bought tickets directly from the club and got to the turnstiles and told they were fake. So there is an in the independent report into this, and and it's, it's very important that the truth comes out in the wash here because I think that for me the the, the grimmest part and the most depressing part of all of this was the haste with which UEFA and the authorities tried to blame uh, the football supporters. You know, the, it's not just Liverpool fans, it's Real Madrid fans as well that, that have, have horror stories from the day. Um, and I think as well, really, you know, look, there's there's tribalism and, and fan rivalry here, but I, there, there really probably should be some solidity among fans because, you know, we can't be naive about it. This this could have, could have happened to any set of fans. You know, there was a lot of people over there from Ireland as well. I'm sure supporting Liverpool. Um, I know David is is a is a big Man United fan. And has probably um travelled to see Man United around Europe, and there's there's been maybe not on, quite on this scale, but definitely involving Man United, Liverpool fans uh, around the continent. There's in Italy particularly. There's been some really uh, terrible sort of fallouts around uh, policing, especially heavy-handed policing. But this seems like a perfect storm of poor planning, uh, inexplicably being ill-prepared for this game. Like the big, Now, I know they didn't. They had relatively short periods of time per, to prepare for the Champions League final because it was thrown on their lap quite late in the day. But, you know, it's, it's in Paris. It's at the start of France. It's not like they're not used to hosting <laughs> huge occasions. So we'll see what comes out in the independent report, but uh, it was really it did overshadow the game, you know. And and as again, you know, we were chatting just before we started recording. Um, you'd wonder how much it affected some of the players because not only is the game delayed, was it was it a half an hour or forty five minutes? It was delayed in the end. And you can imagine just the nerves and preparing for for the biggest game of the season, but also the, 
those players would have had friends, families in the crowd. Nobody really knew what was going on. You knew it was bad. You know, there was thousands of empty seats. They may be getting text messages, looking at Twitter and stuff. Um, it, it was it was pretty grim. It really was. It was uh, an awful shame. Yeah, we'll find out the full story, I'm sure, once it's actually investigated and when, as you said, the independent report comes out. On the pitch, of course, Real Madrid won the Champions League for the for the 14th time, if you include uh, European Cups in there as well. And in ter- um, I suppose David Connolly, in terms of defining defining them as a, as a team, I mean, Liverpool are quite easy to define, but I find Real Madrid, even in the ter- time as in Dean Zidane, that it was hard to kind of put a finger on what they are. You know, they don't seem <laughs> what they represent uh, in terms of an era or anything. And, uh, you know, it's just it just seems to be a, re- a collection of like just really good players, some of them over the hill. But um, it doesn't seem to be just there doesn't seem to be any real sense of philosophy or anything behind it. Um, well, I tell you what I did. I was watching this with my son and um, <clears throat> we did a we did a, a combined team, but we did it in units. Right. And I started off with the keeper, Alison or Courtois. And we all said before the game, Courtois, right? Then we went defence, Liverpool, midfield, Real Madrid, front line um, was Liverpool. So, you know, i got to be honest, some of the reactions afterwards in terms of Thibaut Courtois. And then he mentioned about the respect that, he, I mean, I watch an awful lot of football. I mean, he is a top goalkeeper. That performance would not have surprised, I don't think, anybody. Um, and I guess... You know, some players you might have thought, I don't know, did people think Danny Carver Howe was past it? Wow, you watch that performance and, I mean, come, he was absolutely incredible. He was incredible on the front foot, intercepting, winning things. I mean, he stopped you know, Diaz in his tracks. There was no way past him. I thought he was outstanding. So they did have some really fine individual performances, right? Um, uh, and, and they got through in the semi, for example, you know, Ancelotti turning to his his bench and asking their opinion and it, you know these games were fine margins on another day it might have gone Liverpool's way but um, you know it, it, it was uh, sometimes you need your goal it sometimes just comes down to you need like a couple of players just perform heroics and and uh, uh, you wouldn't say his saves were you know uh, uh, stopped certain goals but there were still saves that had to be made and um you know, he was Courtois was really, really good. Um, make no mistake, on the day he was good. Bit of frustration, I think, from from Jurgen Klopp in terms of you know this anti football. But I mean, he's used to facing a low block, you know, at countless times throughout the season. They maybe didn't have the quite that little bit of craft to open the door or from further out or from even closer in around the box, and and I. Yeah, it was it was a show. I'm a boyhood Liverpool fan, but you know, so so hard to to write off. Yeah, um, and certainly they were deserving. Around Madrid were deserving winners. I think overall, obviously Benzema probably has his name on the Ballon d'Or now. Vinicius has had an unbelievable season for them, and they just have a they have a great partnership. But uh, and as you said, with the low block, I think with the midfield that they have, they're not exactly the quickest. So it's probably the most natural thing for them to be sitting kind of be behind the ball. But I suppose on the overall point and them, uh, David Snaid, I mean, trying to explain what they represent, I think it's, it's quite it is quite difficult. Uh, I mean, compared like the Barcelona team of Pep Guardiola was sort of easy to define. The Milan team of the late eighties, early nineties, you kind of knew what they were about. And but Real Madrid, I think, it pretty much in all of their eras, bar maybe the nineteen fifties one, it, it is. Uh, it just seems to be just a collection of very good players, uh, rather than any sort of system that will kind of define or inspire teams to come. Yeah, possibly. I- Maybe there's, I think it's just a mix of a bit of pragmatism, but having that quality. And it was something I, I thought it was thought it was not obvious, but you could see what they were trying to do in terms of like so, obviously soak up that little bit of pressure and knowing you're going to need that little bit of luck early. But as the game wore on, Liverpool got more more frustrated, and that's when Madrid's quality then kicked in. So like kind of that's what I was saying, like maybe being that having that sense of pragmatism and actually checking their ego a little bit, like players like Modric and Tony Cruz and and Benzema, like these lads could like if they had more bigger egos and were like not maybe wanting to follow that plan that say Ancelotti had obviously and his coaches had had come up with. But as as David had mentioned previously, like 
they do seem to have that kind of work in unison kind of thing. Like that's their strength, you know what I mean? Kind of understanding where you, that we don't have to play one way all the time, that we can mix it up and that we have the players who have that lack of ego, but still have that quality and ability and understanding to be able to do things different way. And sure, by the end of it, as Liverpool got a bit more desperate, it could have been two or three nil, you know, in terms of how Madrid were able to kind of cut through them a little bit. And the goal, like the goal I just thought was fantastic because it was just a team moving the ball comfortably, not getting stressed by Liverpool kind of trying to press. And you saw, like, I know Trent Alexander-Arnold is getting a lot of grief, but like, look at what Andy Robertson does. Andy Robertson, I know Liverpool's whole philosophy and how they play is that aggressiveness and, and the pressing, but what's Andy Robertson doing chasing Modric that far deep and coming out that far, when Modric is just almost, you could just probably sense him having a little chuckle saying, well, I'll just pop the ball around you. And the goal and the space came from Robertson vacating that space down the other end. And then obviously you see Alexander-Arnold, he has one look over his shoulder, knows where Vinicius is, but then like doesn't look again and, and has lost them. Like, should the cross have been stopped? There's two bodies close to him, like Virgil van Dijk comes over. But if you look back at it, I do think for all that talk of maybe it is that risk and reward. I don't think there's any need for Andy Robertson to go chase. And maybe probably in the Premier League, he can get away with it because never what struck, struck even struck in my head there. And he said it there about me being a Man United fan. It reminded me of when Robertson stole the ball in a similar position. I think it was off a Lango and he absolutely destroyed United at Anfield because he kind of knows he can get away with that in a, in a game, certain games and be that high up. But Modric is just, just so calm on the ball. And, that's what I'm saying with that pragmatism and the quality. And then by after a while, they were just able to pass the ball around and they just looked very comfortable for the last 15 minutes in the game. It was uh, it was very nice to watch. It certainly was. Um, now, just on Liverpool, <laughs> uh, certainly on Liverpool anyway, um, Didi Haman on the RT coverage made a point about where they go next. So I'll just play that clip and then David Connolly, I'm interested in getting your thoughts on this. Well, remains to be seen. Uh, Manny will probably say tonight or tomorrow that he's going to leave the club. I think sometimes you've got to freshen things up because this group of players have been together for a long time yeah. and they've done exceptional things. But what I'm saying is that... You go away from, from, the, from the camp tomorrow, you play the, the season of your lives and you end up with two domestic cups and the two biggest prizes, you haven't won. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, psychologically, you come back next season, the lads might be thinking, what do we have to do to win the Premier League or to win the Champions League? Because we couldn't have done any more than we did this season. And you may lose one of your best players or maybe two of your best players. So I think psychologically, I think for the manager, it's a huge, huge job. And I, I, I really think that it could have a bearing, it could have a, a, a negative impact on, on what's to come. Because, you know, there's international games now, then you've got three weeks holiday, you're back. And they know they've got a, 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 a very strong opponent in Manchester City, they won't go away. Um, and the English teams, you know, some of them will be better equipped. Bayern Munich might be better equipped next season, so it won't be any easier to win the Champions League next season because the run to the final was, you know, if you compare it with Madrid, it was rather easy. Um, so I think it could have a, a bigger impact than just losing a game tonight. David Connolly, so in your view, um, I don't know what, what you made of Didi Hammond's point there, but you see evolution or revolution now for Liverpool over the for next season and then beyond? Oh, well, look, yeah, look, I mean, look, I think some players, uh, no one expected Diaz to have the impact he did, right? Um, so he'll be better next season. I think I think if they do lose Mane, I think that'll be a huge hole to fill. And if they do, uh, I would look at the amount of times Jurgen Klopp has taken off Sadio Mane in his Liverpool career. It's been way too many. It's been far too many. Now, I think Jota has been a superb signing. And I think they've they've managed their squad really well, but I don't think they've I don't think Jurgen Klopp has kept Mane happy because if he was going to sacrifice anyone, it would be him and not Salah. I think Salah stayed on the pitch so often to the detriment of Mane. And and I could show you and you could see a thousand well a hundred clips of Sadio Mane being taken off, and look at his body language. And if he does go, it would be because he may maybe he feels he hasn't got. The same respect of, of Salah, who could be walking out the door himself if he's not given the sort of money that, that he wants. Now, he says he's going to stay. Um, but, you know, you always have this, I guess, inquest into things afterwards. I thought Jurgen Klopp got one decision, which was a big call 
He had Matip or Konate to select at the back. That was a huge call to make, a huge call. I, I think he selected the right one and he put Konate there for his pace. But, you know, he's not afraid to make a big call, right? He's not afraid to make a big call. He, I know Salah was on the bench for a few games towards the end. Has he been the same player since AFCON? Probably not, but Mane has. Um, I don't think it's necessarily like a huge inquest where did Liverpool go from here. But, you know, Man City are not going to slow down. They've signed Erling Haaland. They won the league without a centre-forward. You know, they played Grealish. They played Foden as a centre-forward. You know, the, the, how good are they going to be with him in the team? Mm. I mean, they're going, to, mm. they're going to be touching 100 points, right? I mean, uh, so, you know, but Man City, Gundogan's probably not happy. He hasn't played enough. Bernardo Silva always talk, he wasn't happy. I mean, you know, it's not like the wheels are going to come off Liverpool here because when you're a top team like they are, don't tell me Gundogan, who was top scorer last season, is happy, not selected. Or Mares. You know, every, you know, Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea, they'll, you know, they'll all have those little issues bubbling away. Yeah, most certainly. Um, but uh, David Connolly, I know you're, uh, we're going to be letting you go very soon, but we can't do that without uh, touching on Nottingham Forest uh, getting promoted back to the Premier League. For people of a certain age, myself, like say when I was growing up, they were just sort of like a quintessential Premier League club. Been waiting a while to see them back up. In terms of the overall story, what the manager there has done, because they were in a pretty bad place um, going back even a year ago, um, it's remarkable. It's a remarkable rise. Yeah, and, you know, my, uh, I spoke to Stephen Reid, you know, um, like all through the season at different games. Great for him. You know, great for him. You've got to remember, he took over when Christy Hewton left, um, got, got the win against Huddersfield, and they kind of haven't looked back with Steve Cooper in charge. So um, he's kind of, you know, freed the players from too much uh, rigidity. You know, Brennan Johnson has said, you know, he, he kind of hasn't really worked with him. It, all he's done is strip it right back giving them a bit of freedom to go and play, go and express themselves, attack. You know, he's kind of a coach from, come from youth coaching, you know, a bit like Stephen Kenny maybe. And, and he's just gone and attacked the league. And, um, <clears throat> you know, they've been, they've been superb. And uh, uh, they're going to really add to the Premier League. Uh, I wonder, I was trying to suss this out, who was the last manager to take over the team at the bottom of the championship and get promoted <laughs> in the same season? <laughs> Well, I think we all know the answer to that. I think he has an anniversary this year as well. Yeah. <laughs> Roy, well, Roy Keane for people who don't, uh, who aren't yeah, aware of I, that. Well, I, I think I think this was said, but actually, Roy, Roy, I don't know if I said this once or someone else, he, and he corrected. He said we weren't bottom or we were third bottom or whatever it was. You know, it was something like that. You know, Roy knows the detail. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but it was it, it it was fairly fairly it was fairly close. Make no mistake. Yeah. Yeah, so um, David Connolly, um, you've been you've been you've been a great sport today, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna remain with one David now for the remainder of the podcast. So a lot, but, a lot to live up to, a lot to live, <laughs> a, lot up to. To live a lot to live up to. We're gonna be talking League of Ireland next, but David Connolly, thanks a million uh, for taking the it's time nice. and enjoy the uh, block of games, uh, block Ireland games that are coming up. Thanks, cheers, guys. Bye. Perfect. All right, so we have one David remaining, and we've also got Anthony Pine, and we've got a lot of League of Ireland to talk about. So uh, in terms of the Premier Division, let's just run through the results here. And it's Bohemians 1, Drogheda United 1, Derry City 2, Finn Harps 2, Lake Gold from Toll to level things up. Dundalk beating St. Pat's 1-0, continuing their uh, great recent form. UCD 1, Sligo Rovers 1. UCD seem to be picking up points, which we'll talk about uh, very, very shortly. And then Shamrock Rovers at the top, 2-0 winners over Shelburne. So uh, we might start on Derry City, um, David. Um, you know, they've... It's, it's almost, uh, it's not quite a um, tale of two halves in this first half of the season, but they're, they obviously started brilliantly and then suddenly something has switched there and they're struggling for results. But at the same time, you still see character um, coming true because obviously um, they were doing what they did earlier in the season and getting a late goal against Finn Harps. Yeah, like it kind of, it, I'm thinking back to, I remember speaking to Rudy Higgins on the pitch at Talco Park after they had uh, beaten Shells. And I think it was like four or five games in. And he was even saying, listen, we're going to have a patch. We're going to have a sticky patch. We're going to have a, a, a run of games where things don't go the way we want. Because you could tell just even how things were happening at the start of the season. That that was natural that was going to happen. The problem for them is, is that it's been a prolonged and it's happened in a glut of games where they've not even just... like they, he, he would have been saying that, thinking, oh, we just we only get a draw here and... 
or something like that, but they've been they've lost a couple of games, you know, they've been they've been really like struggling. And it kind of strikes me that it's a group of players together who it's a new team, and when things have kind of gone against them a little bit, maybe people looking at each other, well, who's the one to drag us through this? Who's gonna be the one to stand up and do it? Whereas sometimes if it was say a Rovers or a team who were together a couple of more years and had a bit more of an understanding of each other and what how people operate, maybe they could have got through this a, a bit better and a bit quicker and, and, and just come together and manage things through games a bit better. It's kind of maybe showed up, not naivety because there's too much experience still in within the team. And if you look at the experience of say Rudy Higgins in the league and so that his staff too as well with uh, so you know, Alan Reynolds. So it just kind of strikes me that it's something like this is what you would expect from a team, even though they're kind of challenged at the top when things do get a little bit sticky they maybe haven't been able to get through it as well as maybe a team like Rovers who might understand what's required to get through it. And possibly in years gone by, they might not have, have had a team like, like a Rovers or even a Dundalk before, or even Cork when they were doing it, excuse me, who could have punished them and they just suffer from that. Yeah, and uh, in regards to um, Derry City and what they have to do now once the, once the window opens, Anthony, I mean... They have players that are due to come back. I mean, they're missing uh, like the likes of Harkin. Obviously, Michael Duffy has uh, barely had a chance to play this season due to injury. So is it more a case of just one or two bodies, really? Yeah, well, as I say there, like we haven't seen much of Duffy. We haven't seen much of Patrick Mac- McElhenney. And I, I agree with David. Like <clears throat> They were brilliant against Pats and Inch Core, where they hammered Pats. Absolutely brilliant. And everybody was raving about Derry after that game. There's been six games... Since they picked up three points, so they, they haven't been bad in all of those games, but it's just that knack. If you look at Shamrock Rovers as the example now, Shamrock Rovers were beaten in Trotter last week. I don't think many people saw that coming, but then they comfortably beat Shells, you know, and in form Shells in Tallis. So it's that knack of never following up a bad result with another bad result. And that just comes with experience, like getting a squad together, jamming the squad, maybe just adding a little bit more depth. Like they will, they will come good again. Like I, I think Derry will finish second this season. Um, it's hard to look beyond Shamrocks. That being said, Dundalk are starting to actually look like the, you know, the, the main challenger now, and the, the things are starting. The thing with Dundalk is that they had a lot of draws on the board. They've got seven draws, so it's like. Stephen O'Donnell sort of laid down the foundation of first and foremost, let's become hard to beat. And now they're starting to grind out wins. Um, and this, look, it just takes time. Like Rory Higgins was, was, you know, he knows he's got a good squad. He's got a really good team there. There's something happening there, but it, it's probably just going to take, I, I think next season could be their season. I know that's easy to say now because they've had a bit of a wobble. But, you know, as David says, that, that sort of experience of going through, because it's a hard campaign. Like, for example, when they bet Pats, like they, they play Pats off the park at Richmond Park. But then they have to play Pats again, I think a week later, was it? Like it was very quickly. They, they had to play them up at the Ryan McBride. So it's that's really difficult because all these teams are decent size. Uh, Tim Clancy is, you know, there's no way he was going to go up there and, and allow his team to be rolled over. Like that. Like Pats sat in deep. They, come, they dug out a point. So that type of thing makes it hard to keep churning out the wins in the way that we've seen Shamrock Rovers do over the last two years. That that, that, that will come, but that, that's the last piece of the jigsaw, but that's the hardest bit to get right. Um, and I think we've just seen like a little bit of a correction. Maybe things have settled down. Maybe they got a little overexcited up there as well after the, after the Pats win and the start that they had to the season. But they are a good side. They will come again. Um, and I think we it, it's good for the league if they do. You know, if we have a good Derry City, if we have a good Dundalk again, if... Cork City come up from the, the first division and we start to have that that spread of, of decent teams around the country. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned Dundalk there. We'll, we'll touch on them very, very shortly and because I think it, the points... Uh, well, actually, maybe we'll, before we get to Pats, actually, Anthony, I might just follow up your point there about Dundalk and the building of foundations because you actually look at the, uh, the points that they have yeah. now and I think they have more points at this stage of the season than Kenny's, Stephen Kenny's debut season in 2013 now. Obviously, Stephen Kenny went on to huge success with that Dundalk team. I'm not necessarily saying that that's necessarily going to happen here because obviously they have Shamrock Rovers in front of them who are a kind of behemoth at the moment and Derry City are only going to come good. But there's a there's positivity there. 
Uh, sorry, Raph, what I'm hearing is you're taping Steel on for the Ireland job. That's what I'm hearing there. It's coming, <laughs> through, it's coming through loud and clear. <laughs> well, look, if, if he needs an agent, I'm happy to uh, take on that role. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to take on like 50% commission. But uh, just on Dundalk, uh, Anthony. Yeah, well, there is. I mean, look, they're hard to beat. They're hard to beat. They've only lost a couple of games this season. Uh, probably too many draws. But as I said, they, O'Donnell was just hammering down the foundation and probably focusing on looking at them last season on... You know, I, mean, I don't know how many games they lost last season, but they were just too easy to beat. Now, the thing is with Dundalk, Dundalk, they've got a lot of the ingredients that you need to go and challenge to win things. Like, they have a very good goalkeeper, and they have the likes of Benson, Pat Hoobin, Dan Kelly, Andy Boyle. Like, these are lads who've been there, done it. You know, great spine of experience down the team. Um, and... What we're starting to see in the last few weeks is that they they are capable of digging out wins. So, yeah, we'll look, we'll see how far it takes in this season. I, I I can't see beyond Shamrock Rovers winning the league. I hope that, just for the sake of the league, that a Dundalk or a Derry can make a bit of a close run thing of it. Um, but again, similar to Derry, it might just be, you know, Stephen O'Donnell might just need this season to properly. Get his, you know, settle things down, get his hands stuck into the job. And then with a couple more additions in the winter, they come hard, you know. Um, but look, we, we can see that anyone watching Dundalk, like they're they're not an easy team to beat, you know. And, and when they come around to play the Derries and the Shamrock Rovers again, if they can come out the right side, side of those games, you never know. They, 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 they might make a fist of it this year and get involved in the title race. But yeah, I, don't know. I, I just think I just think Shamrock Rovers is just is just a little bit more than the rest this year. I, I, I can't see past. Them. Yeah, I think Pats also were tipped alongside Derry City at one point, and they've kind of they're they're fourth at the moment. They're a good bit off any title talk, but um, not completely out of the race for finishing in the top three. But um, uh, David, I mean, from your point of view, this first half season, like, how would you assess it from uh, the point of Tim or Tim Clancy's point of view? I'd say. He'd be happy with he'd be happy with some aspects in terms of some of the younger players who've obviously come through. But he, I think after after what game was he at the other week at home? Uh, Ball, I don't know, uh, Shelburne, sorry, Shelburne. And what was striking was Shells just had so much more energy and aggression and just almost like a sense of purpose in the game. And Clancy spoke afterwards, just really, really frustrated and annoyed. And not they dug out the players, but just called them out on some of the basic mistakes and not being able to match some of that intensity. And even still create a couple of good chances. Like Chris Forrest, I missed a, a really good chance. Owen Doyle had a really good chance in the first half. And then there was an opportunity in the, in the second half too. And there was just that sense of... Just, he was just frustrated. That seems, I think if you speak to anyone there, it's, it, it, there is that massive element. And if you tie it in, it's only something right to do. If you tie it in with how last season finished winning the cup, but then the fact that how the manner of how Stephen O'Donnell left. And it's an important point to make about Stephen O'Donnell, even in the context of, say, what's going on with Dundalk is, the Pats players all spoke about this. He took a group like Pats, who players there felt was drifting and just going through a malaise and was able to not so much after the four season because obviously it was COVID hit and it was um, it was um, obviously the um, stuff wasn't it? how many games like 16 or 17 games in or something wasn't it but it was more so the past players really began to kind of see how he operated after that and obviously they won the cup they did put it up to Rovers although he finished it a bit off a little bit and he has that ability to do that which is what we're seeing in Dundalk and now that's what Tim Clancy who obviously was appointed very quickly after and that kind of mad week after the cup final, that Patrick they didn't want to leave that vacuum for too long. And um, Tim Clancy, who would have obviously his kind of reputation is kind of was grown obviously from what he done at Drotton and getting them promoted and making them competitive in the, in the Premier Division. And now it's a case of just trying with Pats, just to try and get a level of consistency because the only consistency that's there is not knowing what's going to happen from one game to another. Where they, some games doesn't look to be clicking at all other games they look as if yeah like there's something on and that maybe is what maybe kind of will be will hit going into this break that's what I wonder like will he be kind of you know helps think focus on the positive of some of the good stuff that's been happening there but there's been some really bad performances too and that's probably to be expected from when a new manager comes in having lost a coach before that 
and some core players too, some really important players that were crucial to how Pat's played. Like what, what Anthony was saying there, you kind of, it's almost get, get through this season and get that European spot, try and do well and possibly win the Cup or do well in, in the FAI Cup. And then for next season, that's when you want to see a team begin to really shape up there because to put a bit of faith in them as well and put that little bit of backing in them. Do you know what I mean? There's no point in giving them the job and then for someone who is, is really well thought of and just because maybe there can be a bit of a struggle early on, then saying, well, oh, we made a mistake. I don't think that's the case. See how the rest of the season pans out and then re- it's, it's mad to be saying it because we're only at the halfway point in the season, but because of the manner of how everything ended last year, it's almost as if they just have to try and get through this season a little bit because it was such upheaval. Yeah, and upheaval, I think you could look at Sligo Rovers, Shelburne, Bohemian, separated by two points, upheaval in very different ways, and maybe upheaval isn't the right word for, for all of them, but Anthony, I mean, contrasting emotions for all three of those clubs, I mean, despite the fact that they're that close in the table, but you, you get sense maybe Shelburne, there's a lot of optimism going forward, Bose, you hear the frustration in Keith Long's voice when he's doing post-match interviews, and Sligo Rovers, obviously, no manager at the moment, and you're kind of wondering where what direction they're going to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I just referenced Rovers uh, beating Shelburne on Friday night pretty comfortably, but it, I have to say, I thought Shells did pretty well. You know, in fairness to them, they they play, they kept trying to play, uh, which is important in a game like that because I suppose, as far as Damien Duff's point of view, when you go to Tala, it, it is a bit of a free swing where, where Shells are at the moment. And you could go and completely change your style and your abandon the philosophy and just pack men behind the ball and try and ride it out and get a point and still get bet 3-0 whereas they didn't do that they probably he probably thought this is you know if nothing else a valuable exercise in playing uh, the best team in the country trying to play through them commit to trying to play from the back playing through the thirds which they did I thought they played some good stuff at times it's just the goal for the you know the goal for the top end of the pitch really when you see the, the quality that Sean Grover's had in the top third of the pitch and the players that like Stephen Bradley made four subs uh, with about 15 or 20 minutes to go. I can't exactly remember who came on, but you're talking about like, you know, you're replacing Danny Mandrew with, you know, Greenborg or whoever. Like it's, they just have such, such strength and depth. Um, so yeah, there is. And look, and it's, if you're, if, as a comparison to Bowles, like Keith Ong has been at Bowles for, I think eight years. You know, Damien Duff is, this is his first season. He's Damien Duff. <laughs> like, you know, they've just got promoted. There's absolutely that sense that it's, there, there's just good vibes around the club and the whole Talca Park thing as well. Um, and, you know, if, if Shells can secure a mid-table finish and, and maybe a bit of luck in the cup where they, they get a bit of a run to the quarters or, or even a semi if they, if they get a, little, a bit of fortune in the draw and stuff, um, and yeah, that's you no know, the great year for them, of course. Whereas you know, with the likes of Bowles and, and Sligo, obviously Sligo are, are in between managers at the minute. But you know, Bowles, there is a little bit of stagnation at the minute, um, and that may that that sort of uncertainty and staleness around those clubs might present an opportunity to Shelburne to to look to push into that top five because I can't really see them get like I, the, the bottom three at the minute. I think is is that's going to be as it is, draw the Finn Harps and UCD. I don't really see Shells getting sucked into that. So, yeah, there's absolutely cause for, for optimism for them there at the minute. Yeah, and then draw the United have given themselves a lot of breathing space, just churning away, getting, uh, you know, picking up points consistently. Obviously, they go on a couple of runs where maybe there are defeats, but they've Dara Markey back as well, which is yeah. obviously positive for them. So they look like they're, um, you know, they're, they're going to be safe from that bottom too. Yeah. But, um, David, on the that bottom two. I mean, last week we were speaking to Gary Rogers and he was fairly confident Finn Harps would have enough in hand to finish out of UCD, but it's only two points between them at the moment. Obviously, Finn Harps have the goal difference advantage and a fairly significant one, but how do you see it playing out now? I know UCD, again, likely to lose um, one of their key players and they've already um, lost Colin Whelan to injury, mm-hmm. but um, they have they have given themselves a little bit of hope in recent weeks. Yeah, I... I don't know, is it the most obvious and just stereotypical thing in the world to say, but like, who would you back in a bit of a dogfight to not finish bottom? Like UCD or Oli Horgan's Finn Harps, you know? And like Finn Harps now as well, they've lost player, they've lost obviously Dave Webster for the season with his knee injury. He's a, he's a massive influence in that dressing room. Um, and you kind of, it's, just, it's an interesting one because like Harps, I was up 
uh, early on in the season up at, fin- at Finn Park when they played Pats and they played the better football. Like in terms of during the game on another day, they could have won, they could have been two 0 up before Pats had scored. He missed a couple of chances, and like they have got it in them to be able to play, to play a bit of ball and to be able to to actually hurt hurt teams and dig it out, which they showed against against Derry. Like they were very unfortunate to to not obviously was it injury time or was it late, late goal anyway that the Derry got it back. But, but I just think I think I think Finn Harris will struggle. I think draw the possibly you mentioned that Americi like that maybe playmaking ability can come in and a bit of X factor when it's needed but I would say I just think yeah, UCD I just think we'll, 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 it could be a struggle listen it's about it's, we've seen it with Shelbourne though we've seen it with Shells where if they're able to get a couple of wins if you get a couple of wins together things have a very different complexion and things look very different for you so like that's be one aspect like I don't but I just don't see UCD or Finn Harps really being capable of putting back to back wins together Possibly, more, maybe more so, Harps with a couple of home games, and you never know. Like, but I don't know. I just the instinct on it just says from from seeing a bit of Harps. I think they've got more about them than UCD in terms of being able to have a bit of know how. They've got a couple of other bodies who are obviously still new to the league. Like Bastian Hardy seems to have, uh, he seems to have kind of taken on a bit of a mantle as well, and is getting them playing a bit too. And like Ryan Connolly has. That ability to play to produce moments, but also has that little bit of grit about him. I just seen UCD play a few times this year, and without being cruel about it, like it's a, like they just don't have that. They just don't have that maybe aggression that could be needed in certain games to just get a draw or even stick hold on to hold on to points. You know. Yeah, and what both teams will be obviously wanting to avoid either automatically or by a playoff is dropping into the first division where the results over the weekend, the top two met Galway United losing 1-0 at home to Cork City, Matt Healy with the winner and then Rory Keaton getting sent off with 23 minutes to go, Waterford now seem to be in form, uh, definitely um, definitely uh, right in third there and not too far away from Galway United, beating Treaty United 4-0. Bray Wanderers, 3-0 winners over Athlone Town, who are uh, bottom of that first division. And then Cove Ramblers losing 4-2 at home to Longford Town. Cove Ramblers always seem to be involved in kind of high-scoring games as well, just kind of looking at their results. But um, starting on uh, Galway and Cork, so Oisín Langan was there for us, so um, here's his report and also speaking to both managers. It'll be crossed in by Ed McCarthy towards the back post. Moreira's header! Harrington gets something on it. Is it behind the line? There's a scramble and Harrington dives on it. The Galway supporters firmly believe that that ball crossed the line. Of course, we don't have VAR, so we have no way of knowing. But it was mightily close. It remains somehow. Galway United nil, Cork City won. John, have you lost one tonight that you could have, at the very least, drawn? Did you Did you think that you deserved a draw? Well, I, well... Maybe I'm biased, but I certainly thought we deserved a draw. You know, I think you know they got a fantastic goal. Healy, we know, he's, we know, we spoke about that all week. Give him a chance from 25, 30 yards. He scores. You need to close it down. Have to give him that opportunity. And he's Maxon in the top corner. Um, you know, but Wilson's one of the two at the back post. The header, the second header, the first one off the line. It looked like it was in. And um, second half we dominated again. But um, we felt at half time we were, we were playing well. Obviously, we moved we moved the ball quite well, and we're switching and getting balls in the box. Maybe the sending off in some in some ways maybe helped them in the sense that they decided to put everyone behind the ball then and it became difficult for us to break us down. And even with Ronan came on with his magic, he found it difficult to get through so many bodies. But at the same time, look, at, I keep saying these are a good bunch of lads. Um, they tried their damnedest tonight. They gave everything and, um, you know, you... you uh, you, you take a break and you move on after the break. You're building something special here. And of course, you've been linked to the Sligo job, not by yourself, but you know yourself when a job becomes available, people look at the managers who are doing a good job. So it's a compliment to you. Do you have anything to say about that? Do you have anything you want to say about that? Or are you happy here building something? Because there is something special here. I've been here a couple of times this season and it's a, it's a great place to come and watch football. And the manager of Galway United have been loyal to every club I've been manager for. And there's no reason why I would want to do anything other than stick here and uh, see can we drive this team on and do the best we can. Matt Healy will let one go. Healy, what a goal from Matt Healy. A magnificent right-footed strike. The keeper beaten all ends up. The shot coming from just outside the box on the left-hand side. It had such a beautiful swerve. Currents dived after it, but he couldn't stop it. Galway United nil. Cork City won. Matt Healy with yet another stunner for City this season. Yeah, no, listen, it's a, it's a massive uh, result for us. Um, massive performance. 
Um, I thought we were we were brilliant. We knew coming up here it was going to be difficult. Um, they're very strong on set plays, throw-ins. They they are they're a very powerful team. But I thought we were we were magnificent. Um, it's a credit to the players and um, the lads that came on. Um, I thought we were we were fantastic, and I thought we deserved the win. No matter what happened tonight, there was a long time to go anyway. But how significant is it to be one point in front instead of five points behind? Oh, absolutely, and I and to be honest, I, I didn't think of that. And listen, like coming up here, I knew that for the squad that I have, and coming up here, I knew that listen, we could go here and, and get the three points. And the players did that. I said it to the players all week. It goes, it's about us. It's about what we do. We go up here and we put on performance. We get the three points. It was a small bit more difficult when Keats got sent off. But the players, they put their bodies on the lines and listen, they, they were fantastic. They, they put their heads where they had to. Um, and it, it was, it, overall, it was defensively, we were, we were brilliant. Uh, that's Oshin Lange speaking to uh, Colin Healy, Cork City manager, and then also John Caulfield, the Galway United boss. So um, first on Cork City, David, um, I mean, they were coming into it having dropped points for the first time in a long time and the I guess the onus was on them with Galway United kind of storming um into the into the up to the top of the division um the onus was on them to try and get three points and certainly they managed it quite well yeah like like what, what Anthony was saying earlier about having a title race in the in the premier division it seems as if we definitely have one in the fourth division and when you throw in the added element of uh, of John Caulfield to the mix and how things kind of went that at Cork and how things ended at, at Cork, it's just gonna be great to uh, it's just gonna be great to watch. And you see some of the players I say the coming through at, at Cork too and what St. Caulfield is trying to do now at, at Galway. Like I was laughing I was when he was uh, when Oshin was saying to me about the Cork job, oh I say about the Sligo job and I was like normally when he was the manager of Cork he used to just always buy left backs off Sligo or just get lads from Sligo whereas it'd be ironic now if he actually ends up ends up there. But that's going to be the fascinating thing. Like they are kind of maybe I'd say there was some disappointment with how last year went at, at Galway too. I think like last year obviously for Cork was about just trying to just get the show back on the road a little bit. I think Colin done a fantastic job there and what he's done and brought some of the players he's brought through and see lads like Aaron Bulger too, like just serious pedigree and getting getting them back on track too, which would be really good to see. But it's going to be interesting and kind of, I can, kind of kind of thinking like as the season goes on if things kind of get wrapped up in the in the Premier Division is the focus then going to be on on the force and what and what happens and when you mentioned as well the, the kind of the spread of clubs be great it would be great to see a Galway and a Cork come up and be like thriving in their league and make it more that well round oh, kind of spaced out really I suppose and get that that sense because we've seen sometimes you know, great positivity and stuff about, about the attendances in the in in the levels and that's happening in the fourth division as well. You know what I mean? It shouldn't be ignored what's what's happening. And that's because of some of the excitement that is that is building around those clubs and some of the players that are coming through. But like oh, just really excited to see how that, that pans out. And you look at Waterford as well. They could talk earlier about they'll put their run together. It was a five or six wins in the trough for them. Like they had a, obviously a brutal start to change managers. But like shouldn't be forgotten, water for a full time club. You know, as the season goes on, expect them to get stronger with the resources that are behind them and the facilities that they have as well. Some of the experience that could be there too. Like they're seven or eight points off the top, but again, similar. Like the, the point stands, Cork. You could expect them to have a bit of a blip. You would expect Galway to to have that as well. Um, still, it will come again for Waterford. But you can see Waterford being capable of putting continuing a run because of the infrastructure that's there behind them. Yeah, and certainly in the Women's National League, while there is a title race of sorts in the first division, at least for the race for promotion in the Women's National League, I think that seems to have dissipated a bit uh, compared to the three-way battle we were expecting. So Wexford Utes uh, remain in good form, though they beat Athlone 2-1 at home. Bohemians uh, beat P-Mount 2-1, so P-Mount kind of slipping back in the last few weeks. Treaty United nil, Sligo Rovers nil, DLR Waves nil, Galway 1, and then Cork City losing 4-0 at home to Champions Shelburne, who are well in control at the top um I, as uh, i think we were when we were doing the preview with lisa fallon earlier in the season in march just before the season kicked off um as i said um anthony we were expecting you know shelburne p mount and probably wexford to be in this battle but the way it's looking um i'm not obviously it's not over and i'm certainly p mount and wexford as chasing teams won't be thinking that way but certainly shelburne are well in control here yeah they've stolen the march i mean it was such a brilliant end to the season last year, the way that Shells just nicked it on the last day. But it was 
it was between them and Pimelt on the final day, but Wexford were actually very close. You know, they were only a couple of results away from from nicking it themselves, and then they went on to win the cup as well. But like Shelburne, uh, they kept hold of Saoirse Noon, and she was going to Durham, and they've kept hold of her until the summer. So they are going to lose Saoirse Noon, but they still got. Jess Sue and Abby Larkin and, and some very good players. Um, you know, they, I suppose as well, like if you look at the results over the last few weeks, it's an indication that the division overall is getting stronger. You know, the likes of um, like Sligo Rovers are new to the league and, and have done well. You know, they've, they've taken points off teams. Athlone have improved. Yeah, Athlone have been yeah. brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they've been really, they've been excellent. Uh, Bohemians have improved. So they're, you're, you're seeing. Uh, P Mount and Wexford slipping up against those teams where that it, it that wouldn't have happened that wasn't happening in the last couple of years. I think shells are so far have have found a way to just keep getting past them and and, and that's how they've opened up this gap. But I, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's done and dusted yet. As I said, they're, they're going to lose Sir Shannon, which is a which is a blow. Um, and then you know we'll see if Wexford and P Mount can can sort of mount a, a late rally, but they are both capable of doing that. Um, and bringing things nicely to the boil then for another, hopefully another, another good end of the season because that was unbelievable last year the way that that finished was, was amazing. Yeah, and with the international break in the men's game, um, the women's national league does continue this Saturday. So there are fixtures uh, between Sligo Rovers and Wexford. That's twelve o'clock, and then at Lone Town against Bohemians at five. Treaty United and DLR Waves and P Mount and Cork City at the same time, and then also Shelburne and Galway also at five. Which I think brings us to a close. We've had a good long marathon there. Um, David Snade, uh, thanks a million for uh, for joining us today, and Anthony Fine, of course. Uh, also, thanks to yourself for uh, for popping on this week. Obviously, Obviously, fixtures for people this weekend in terms of the international teams. So on Friday, there is the Ireland under-21s against Bosnia and then the senior game against Armenia in Yerevan, which is both games live on RT2 and the RT player. Check out the website for details. But lads, thanks a million. Thanks, Rob. Take care.